Fantastic. So hello to everybody. Thank you for joining me, Holly Barker. Um, Thank you. So today we're going to have a chat about something which is close to both of our hearts. Try and unpick a potentially difficult topic. Um, coming from the viewpoint of obviously we're both Border Collie uh, lovers, enthusiasts, um, and also we commonly see nowadays, would you say commonly? Do you... Yeah. Yeah, increasingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is definitely increasing. Um, posts on social media about border collies and ADHD or autistic type behaviors, and the people labeling their dogs. So we wanted to unpick this <laughs> and go into it. And it means unpicking. Yeah, um, from a scientific background or a scientific basis. So, Holly, can you just before we start for anybody that doesn't know you and I'll do the same afterwards can you just give us a little teeny bit of your background as to um your knowledge behind this and who you are yeah. <laughs> so so my name is Holly Barker um I'm actually a canine nutritionist um but equally I am a registered mental health nurse which means that um I specialize in the area of mental health and psychiatry which includes um, things like autism and ADHD, um, among plethora of, of other illnesses, but that's my specialism. Um, I've also uh, recently in the past year been diagnosed with ADHD myself, um, so that gives me a, an, an extra insight into these things. Um, and part of that diagnostic process also looked at um, some autistic features as well, but I wasn't I wasn't diagnosed with that. Um, I have six dogs, five are border collies. One's a pretendy collie. He's actually a lurcher, but he um, he came to me under the guise of a collie. Um, and I have been rehabilitating failed sheepdogs since I was 16. So that's 20 years. So um, that's why I'm chatting about this today. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's absolutely great and um so for those of you who don't know me I'm Sarah Hedley um I run the Border Collie Academy so I work purely with Border Collies in my dog training um business so hence my uh interest in Border Collies I've got three dogs uh two Border Collies and one mini American Shepherd who is very different from the a lot of people think that they are just small Border Collies they're not um they're very different indeed so um yeah very passionate about border collies so let's dig in to this uh this yeah. subject um can we start by maybe defining all of the words that people use around this so what is autism what is adhd neurodivergent um are they all the same are they all different um I'll throw this one over to you. <laughs> so um, the way I work, um, we have to, so medical professionals, we have to um, work alongside something called the um, ICD-11. And what that is, it's the International Classification for Diseases. And within that, you have everything that you could possibly di be diagnosed with ever, mental health, physical health whatever um, and with that you have codes so when I'm working with human patients um, as part of a, a diagnostic process once a diagnosis has been reached um, in the medical notes we will add the the ICD code and what this does is it means that perhaps for other professionals who may not be um au fait with specific diagnoses or the symptoms or or how that presents in a person they can go and look up the code and it gives you a definition so i've done that here i've got my laptop here and i'll read it out to you um so the the way it's broken down is um that there are essential features um and that's what you're looking at so autism and ADHD have a lot of features, a lot of symptoms. Autism is on a spectrum. Um, so it's not set in stone. It just gives you a basis for which to diagnose. So we'll start with ADHD in the ICD-11. And it says a 
persistent pattern of inattention symptoms or a combination of hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms. Symptoms have an onset before 12 years of age and are outside the limits expected for age and level of intellectual development. Persistent and severe enough to have a negative effect on academic, occupational or social functioning. Evident across multiple situations, e.g. in the home, school, work with friends or relatives, but may vary with the structure and demands of the setting. Symptoms are not due to the effects of substances or medication. They are not due to a disease of the nervous system and they are not better accounted for, for for another mental disorder such as anxiety, a fear-related disorder, neurocognitive disorder, or delirium. When we start talking about border collies, that's the bit that's important. And then that's, that's keeping it simple. That's just the essential features. As I say, it can be much broader. Certainly for my own diagnosis, it was broader. Um, I, and I know a lot of uh, other women because it presents differently in men than in women, that's something that we've started to learn. Um, I don't particularly have the hyperactivity. Occasionally I do, but it's not a main feature. We'll move on to autism spectrum disorder. So the description is autism spectrum disorder is characterized by persistent deficits and the ability to initiate and sustain reciprocal social interaction and social communication and by a range of restricted, repetitive and inflexible patterns of behaviour, interests or activities that are clearly atypical or excessive for the individual's age and socio-cultural context. The onset of the disorder occurs during the developmental period, early in childhood, but symptoms may not become fully manifested until later. When the social context demands exceed limited capacities. Deficits are sufficiently severe enough to cause impairments in personal, family, social, educational, occupational and other important areas of functioning and are usually a pervasive feature of the individual's functioning observable in all settings, although they may vary according to social, educational or other context. Individuals along the spectrum exhibit a full range of intellectual functioning and language abilities. The diagnostic requirements that are essential, um, it's quite long. I'll do um, the persistent deficits and then we're not on this for too long. But it's understanding of or interest in or inappropriate responses to the verbal or nonverbal socio-communication of others. Integration of spoken language with typical complementary nonverbal cues such as eye contact, gestures, facial expressions and body language. These nonverbal behaviours may also be reduced in frequency or intensity. Understanding and use of language in social contexts and ability to initiate and sustain reciprocal social conversations. Social awareness leading to behaviour that is not appropriately modulated according to the social context. Ability to imagine and respond to the feelings, emotional states and attitudes of others. Mutual sharing of interests. Ability to make and sustain typical peer relationships. Persistent, restrictive, repetitive and inflexible patterns of behaviour, interests or activities that are atypical or excessive to the individual's age and socio-cultural context, which may include lack of adaptability to new experiences and circumstances with associated distress, which can be evoked by trivial changes to a familiar environment in response to unanticipated events, inflexible adherence to particular routines, excessive adherence to rules, excessive and persistent ritualized patterns of behavior, repetitive and stereotyped motor movements such as rocking, an atypical gait such as walking on tiptoes, and unusual hand or finger movements and posturing. Persistent preoccupation with one or more special interests, objects or specific types of stimuli, lifelong excessive and persistent hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity to sensory stimuli, 
or an unusual interest in sensory stimuli. The onset of the disorder occurs during the developmental period, typically in early childhood. The symptoms result in significant impairment to family, social, educational, occupational, or other areas of functioning. So quite involved. Yeah. Um, and as we're reading those out, you can see why um, Sarah and I, and probably lots of other people, get really quite annoyed when people start putting these really complicated, complex um, human diagnoses onto colleagues. Yeah. specifically colleagues I haven't seen it so as uh, people maybe touch on it a little bit in spaniels I would suppose or the ADHD side but yeah putting putting these extremely complex um diagnoses onto dogs with the the barest of reasons why um has prompted this conversation uh, absolutely and I think you know when you're reading through that you could go uh tick for border collie tick for border collie tick for border collie but then we look at what a border collie is bred to do. Yeah. What and is this was... a normal border collie? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is my thing. It's not that border collies have ADHD. It's that ADHD looks like a border collie. Yeah. And the reasons for that are because of the way that they're bred. Um, and, and the biochemistry around what, what their original purpose was um, and how that works. So what it didn't say in the ICD just there about ADHD um, is that it is a disorder of dopamine. So a lot of the behaviours that you have with ADHD are related to the, um, the, the production of dopamine. People with ADHD don't produce enough dopamine and that's what causes the behaviours. Um, and the way that that relates to Border Collies is they have been bred to be intrinsically rewarded. So what that means is, you know, way back when the breed was developed, we didn't have puggies, we didn't give treats, we didn't do any of that. The dog had to work because it wanted to and because it got pleasure from that. And the science behind that is this intrinsic reward system, which... Um, works by eliciting a dopamine response and so an example of that for humans would be um, and this has been studied in the literature as well it's completing a task for the enjoyment of it and once that task is completed you get a release of dopamine and what that does is it plays on the reward centers of the brain so that you will continue to seek behaviors that elicit that reward system and border collies are just great at this we've all heard the saying if you don't give a collie a job it will go self-employed and that's why it's seeking this dopamine um for humans what it can look like is well it's huge and it's varied um and it can look strange as well some of some of my strange things, um, or maybe not strange, things that people can relate to, actually, I'll probably go for. So I used to smoke, um, and stopping smoking was really difficult for me as someone with ADHD because I would use it as a reward. So if I was at work and I had a really, really boring task to do, I mean, I don't cope well with boring or repetitive tasks at all, um, I knew that at the end of doing that job, I would have a cigarette and that would reward me because nicotine releases dopamine. Um, and if it was a really big job, what I'd do, or something that I really disliked, what I'd do is I would plan the dopamine hit at the end so that I'd get the most reward. So it would be not just a cigarette, it would be a perfectly made cup of coffee at the right temperature with a really nice biscuit followed by a cigarette and that's three things that are going to give me all of the dopamine and especially if it's my favorite biscuit and especially if it's a perfect temperature cup of coffee and especially if I get to enjoy, enjoy that outside in the sunshine with no one disturbing me I'm going to get the the most perfect dopamine hit ever and straight away I've been rewarded for doing an awful task um and that kind of planning, um, it's all in my head while I'm doing it. But 
it's significant. And I would do that multiple times a day just to get through having boring jobs to do. Because sometimes in my work, it's 12 hour days of boring jobs. Um, so I needed planned rewards in order to do that. And we know how that works in dog training. Yeah. So this is this is yeah. the, the the main bit for me. Um, so mm -hmm. border collies like and there are obviously a, a lot of different breeds. Border collies mm -hmm. have been found to have more dopamine. Yes. So, whereas with ADHD, they're found to have not enough. Mm -hmm. So border collies, if you look at it just from that point of view, are very different. They're still dopamine seeking mm -hmm. because of the repetitiveness. And if they're working on a hill all day, finding sheep, bringing them in, you know, and that is a very repetitive um, job. But they will do it, as you say, without a reward of a tuggy or a food reward because they get pleasure out of the actual job that they're doing. But they've already yeah. got more dopamine in their brains mm -hmm. than some mm -hmm. other dogs that aren't as active and that won't keep going. So this is quite mm -hmm. a big difference, isn't it? Yeah. And that's one of the things when I see on social media, colleagues definitely have ADHD. I just roll my eyes and I just think that's such a misunderstanding of the breed. Yeah. Huge, huge misunderstanding of the breed. Um, and also, I find it a little bit offensive to people that do have a neurodivergence, because what it does is it oversimplifies the struggle that those people have. I mean, I've just spoken a little bit about some of the ways that I seek dopamine. Were any of those things good for my health? No. Excessive caffeine intake, not good. Um, excessive intake of bad foods. Well, we can tell that I, I'm not a slim person. I heavily rely on naughty foods for dopamine. Um, and I get fixated um, as well on certain foods for dopamine. At the minute, it's little, it's these little egg custard tarts that you get from Lidl. They're the best thing in the world. Um, and <laughs> and it's giving me all the dopamine. And I, I know that in a month, I'll be so sick of them that I'll never look at one ever again. And then I'll have to find something else to give me the dopamine. You just don't see that in dogs. You don't see that in collies. The things that they get fixated on that they love, 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 they're going to love forever. Yeah. Bulls are a really good example of that. Just going to say this, and this is where it's an unhealthy thing for them to become obsessive about bulls because they will be totally obsessive. It's like the, um, the drug addict. It they they yeah, and it's for life. They think they enjoy it, but actually, it's not a healthy obsession, and they will keep going and keep going, and they they won't get fed up with it in a month's time. Um, so yeah. yeah. And I suppose that's where people go, well, that's that's the autism type bit. It's it's re it's really not, because if it, when you look at people who are on the autistic spectrum um, or ASD, as we call it, autistic spectrum disorder. Yes, there are lots of people who have the same interests um, as part of their autistic spectrum disorder. But it's not like it is with collies where you can maybe pick four things. So um, balls, cars, movement. Um, what's another one? Balls, cars, movement. What else do they get obsessed with? Um, other dogs. Yeah, or household things even. Um, yeah. Oh, so hoovers and mops and things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... If that was if that was ASD, it wouldn't be there as a singular. A singular obsession does not make for for ASD. Um, again, I find it a little bit insulting to people who do have ASD that people think that just one obsession makes for that. Um, and balls are a really good example because that's a a fairly standard one. Again, as part of your high energy breeds, that's not even just collies. I mean, I have friends with Malinois who and GSDs, they all have to have the big yellow ball on a string. And it's, you know, it, it's it's more of a thing with dogs, really. So it picking it apart, it's it's not helpful um, in in helping your dog or understanding your dog to diagnose it with one or both um, of these issues, because it's not going to it's not going to help you fix it it's not going to help you understand your dog um 
I've obviously had ADHD all of my life. And despite the fact that I'm a mental health professional, it wasn't until, you know, in the past five years that I clicked and thought, that's what's wrong with me. How did I not know? Um, and that's, you know, that's that's my bread and butter. I do, mental health is my job. It's it's, it's what I've done for the, the past 10 years. Um, and I didn't click onto it about myself or some other people that I know who also clearly have it. It's just, it's it's really difficult to pin down, um, I think which makes it even more. It's recognized yeah. more now, isn't it? There's become Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot. Yeah, there's been a lot of it on social media, um, you know, uh, TikTok and things like that, talking about, you know, these are some of the traits of ADHD. These are some of the things that I do. Um, and it's great that awareness has has been raised and that in that people have been able to get on the road to a diagnosis and get help if they need it and all of that. But what has also happened is this, oh, my dog does that. Oh, my dog does that. It's a bit naughty. Yeah. Can we also talk about another really common thing, which is misunderstood mm -hmm. fixation part of it? Because obviously mm -hmm. collies are bred and have eye and they use their eye to do what they so brilliantly do, control movement. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about fixation because obviously when a sheepdog is working, they're using their eye, but they're actually still able to listen to the shepherd who's guiding them as to you know move them yeah. to the right or back off a little bit or move up a bit um so it's it's a really they can focus for a long period of time but they can yeah. listen and um mm -hmm. you know and obviously that is a bit of a skill because some young dogs get fixated onto things and then they don't listen in a pet home yeah. because they haven't been taught how to yeah. um but can we unpick this a bit? Because again, it's something which yeah. a, a border collie without eye is really no good as a sheepdog. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so I share a picture of uh, of my dog, Ren, that explains this quite well. And to an untrained eye, it just looks like a dog looking at a sheep. So what we've got is that Ren is working in pens with sheep. Um, and what that means is, is that we have um, a big a big herd of, of, of fat lambs. So the lambs that have been taken off of their mums, so they're, they're young, they're flighty. Um, they don't know Wren because she's not their usual dog. Um, and they haven't seen a dog often enough. This is the other thing people, people don't um, get about collies is when the sheep are used to their dog, it's a whole different ball game. You know, sheep aren't stupid. They'll, they'll know who their usual dog is um, and they'll know a, a new dog. So in this picture, we're pushing lambs up races, and what races are they? They're small, um, narrow shoots, and the sheep go through them one at a time, and we'll vaccinate them or give them um, a mineral drench. We'll check their body weight, all of that. So it's it's maintaining the health of the lamb, and there's sort of a gathering area before they go one by one, and you let small amounts of sheep through the race at the time, and you need a dog for that. Um, and you need the dog to do something called pushing up, which is keep them all at the at the right end of the gate. So in this picture, what we have is my dog, Ren. And she is staring directly at a sheep. And there's a line of sheep. And the one that she's staring at is looking away because she's just in the process of turning it using her eye. However, her ears are like this. One ear pointing over there and one ear pointing over there. That ear pointing over there is pointing at a sheep that is a lamb um, that is just about to make a break for it. All of the lambs want to make a break for it because of the pressure. They can see that they're getting funneled and that for a prey animal is uncomfortable. And then behind them where the dog is, they can see all of this open space and that's where they want to be. And there's only one of her and there's a lot of them. So she's keeping an, an ear on this, this lamb that wants to break free and is about to. And behind that lamb, there's six others all in a line waiting for that one to break free so they can do what she do and follow. And then there is another that's wanting to do the same thing. So what she's doing in this split second of a moment is she's planning. And I don't know if you've ever seen the film Sherlock Holmes but it goes into this breakdown of how he's gonna take this man down by fighting him. 
and he does this slow motion of um of a fight scene and he sort of says i'm going to punch him in the face and that's going to break his nose and he's going to fall forwards and as he's going to fall forwards i do this and that and it plays out in slow motion the scene it's a little bit like that so what she's doing is right i'm going to turn this sheet this one is the priority because it's it's in the middle and it's a bolshy sheet it's definitely a ringleader i'm going to use my eyes the most effective way of turning this sheet now what she could do as well and this shows how dogs um sheep dogs learn to prioritize and are decision makers this is the other thing about collies they are decision makers a lot of them do not like how we micromanage them and they resent us for it. So what she could do, which would solve this problem like that in an inexperienced dog, is she could just bite it on the nose and that would make it run away. But that would cause panic and she would lose the two sheep at either side that she's keeping an eye on. So she's not going to do that. She has to use her eye and she's learned that in the space of her work. So she uses her eye on the middle sheep, it turns and as that turns, at the point where she knows it's not going to turn back, she quick as a flash goes over to the other sheep that's on the left, really strong eye on that one, get back you, no biting, she wants to still, she still wants to bite, get back you, that one turns and as that one's turning, the one on the very far left thinks now's my chance and she says no it's not. So she takes a wide loop behind me to get ahead of it. If she went straight across, she'd lose it. So she takes a wide loop behind me and then really gets on that sheep, gets all in its face, less eye, more about using its body to get it to get back. That's a lot. Yeah. But it happens in three seconds, if that, and she's just boom, boom, boom. And then they're all back under control and she goes back into lying down and going, come on, try it. Because that was fun. I just manipulated like, 15 sheep all in one go just by looking at them that was immense I love being manipulative and she does love being manipulative she loves using her brain and her body and her decision making skills to influence what other beings do and it's not just sheep because for her there's a hierarchy sheep are easy they're easy to manipulate humans not so much if she manages to manipulate a human she's like yes yeah, I'm so clever. That intrinsic reward, that dopamine, huge for manipulating a human into doing what she wants it to do. Manipulating another dog, 100%, even better because dogs are dogs are a predator. And she likes being, this is the other thing, the, the whole the, the dominance theory, yes, outdated, bad. But when you get a pack of collies, what you have to understand is because of this manipulation that they seek to engage in, there will always be one that wants to be on top. There will always be one that wants to be chief manipulator. It's usually a bitch, to be honest, um, but not always. So, again, multi-dog households, the colleisms can become stronger. And this is why. And why it looks like ADHD is because it looks like flight of ideas, moving from one thing to the next to the next. But it's not. It's ha We need them to be like that. We need them to do three things at once and execute them all in a very short space of time. Um, and as someone with ADHD, that I, 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 I get that. Um, I get told a lot. I can I, I can't. Um, I find it very difficult to concentrate on one thing at a time if there aren't other things going on. Um, I need music in the background. I need to be kind of singing along to a favourite song in order to get stuff done because if I don't have that, find it hard to concentrate without getting distracted. You know, there needs to be a background of something in order to focus. The flip side is if something interests me, really interests me, and I'm getting all of the dopamine from it, I hyper focus. And if someone speaks to me while I'm doing that, I I will be awful. I'll I'll just shit, shut up. <laughs> Don't distract me. Just leave me alone. Go away. Stop it. Um and that's where the the behaviors um in me come from that aren't socially acceptable is that if I am having if I've gone into hyper focus and someone interrupts me, I can't cope with it. And where you see that in a collie is They'll be focusing on something um, and someone will decide that they don't want them to do that and they'll try and recall them, snap them out of it, make them do something different and they don't want to. They're having a nice time. So they'll try and manhandle them and they'll get bitten. Yeah, it's like redirect. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not because 
they've got ADHD. It's because whatever it is that they're doing is giving them the dopamine because they function at a higher level of dopamine as a standard. They have to do more things to keep that level up. Yeah. Um, and so this is where you get the the obsessions and the fixations. Yeah. And it's 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 a great way of explaining it because obviously I've just done a training on car chasing collies. And yeah. you know, before we actually start training them to be more socially acceptable and safe around vehicles, we've got to actually look at what rewards we're going to use. Because mm. if we're trying to give, just give them a biscuit when they're getting off on trying to control the movement of a car, it's not, not enough. going to work. So we need to build that reward history so that they're getting what they want off of the rewards before we actually put the rewards into the training scenario. And a lot of people start with the training scenario and haven't thought about that whole reward structure. Um, and then they don't know why using rewards what they perceive as rewarding rewards won't work. But again, if we look at the collie, they will work all day long with sheep without a tug toy, a piece of food. They'll just get a pat on the head and a good boy at the end of the day or a good girl, you know, because the job is actually rewarding to you. And them. it's really interesting when you when when you've gotten the when they've gotten the intrinsic reward. So when they they've done something that's really satisfy them. They look for confirmation. Um, and again, I I don't really see this in my dogs, except for in work, the, seek it, the, the confirmation that they've done a good job. They're not wanting a reward. They're, they're wanting the words. They want it absolutely clear. Did I do good? And you go, yes, you did. Um, and in work for all of my dogs, actually, when they've done that, you tell them that'll do, that the job's done, and they come running over, they've got a big smile on their face. Anyone that says that collies don't smile, I don't believe you. All of my dogs smile. They've got, you know, the, their face is happy, and they come lolloping over, they're tired, they're feeling good, they've got a buzz on. Throw themselves at my feet and just look up at me, and, the, and that's the moment, and you go, oh, good dog. And they're like, I'm a good dog. <laughs> Yes, you, I know I'm good. You've told me that I'm good. This is amazing. And you give them a love and they're literally, it's a moment and and you can feel it. It makes you just as happy as it makes them. It's such a, a relationship affirming moment. And it doesn't have to be in sheep. It just has to be whatever it is that fulfills that dog in that way. Um, one of my dogs will do it for, for anything, training, but it doesn't matter what it is. She just loves to learn. And when she's learned something new and she's figured out that it pleases me and she'll do it by herself. And then when all the pieces click into place and she thinks, oh, I've got it. She comes running back and she's like, I did it. And I'm like, oh, no, yay. Well, oh, well done. She's like, yeah. It's, yeah. it's about the relationship. And this is another thing that, really gets missed with collies um is you know these dogs have been bred to be you know intuitively man's best friend all of them you know that day in day out they're you know they're sat up front in a land rover they're sat on the back of a quad bike with their head on your shoulder they're looking where you're looking the amount of dogs i've worked where we're out checking sheep whether it's lambing time or or just you know daily checks and you think that you spot something and just as you spot it, the dog goes, I'll go look. And away it's gone. You've not had to give a command because they sense everything that you've just seen. You've seen a sheep down. They've seen a sheep down. You're thinking, oh, I'm going to go look at that. And before you've moved your muscles to turn the quad bike, they're like, it's OK, I know what you want. I'm going I'm to go ahead. I'm going to go look. We've bred them to be intuitive, to be one step ahead of us, to be our friend, to um perceive everything that we do before we even do it and what that means is that they are incredibly good at spotting patterns and this is where people think that they're autistic and they're not yeah do you want to have a little chat about patterns because I know that you we've spoken about this before haven't we yeah it's um it, it's the things where um people say oh if I say such and such a word and it's usually something simple like right because yep, if they always get right. up from the sofa to go to bed, they'll have a little sequence of events. So they'll say, right, bedtime. And then they'll go to stand up, turn the telly off, let the dog out, all the rest of it. 
as soon as they literally do that very first part of the pattern, the dog's there because they yeah. know. And they might be highly stimulated. <laughs> Maybe they get a biscuit before bed as part of the routine as well. So as soon as they say, right, the dog runs to the cupboard where the biscuit is, or it runs to the door because they know that maybe their owner's going to go out to work at the beginning of the day or yeah. something like that. So we can actually use patterns as well as our dog recognizing patterns, can't we? Because they like recognizing patterns. Um, they, that, that initial trigger in the pattern can give that dopamine release. Um, mm. So, you know, we can definitely manipulate and use patterns to our advantage um, and not just allow our colleagues to recognize the patterns that we didn't even realize that we were doing. Yeah, and it can be the smallest thing as well. In our house, um, uh, my partner, Brian, takes his glasses off before he does anything, before he goes to the door, before he lets the dogs out, um, so the trigger in our house is literally that sound, the sound of the glasses being folded. And as soon as that click happens, it's an eruption. Everyone's like, something's happening. Um, and they all have to tell each other, something's happening. We're about to do something. Everybody gets excited. And Brian's just like, how do they know? I'm like, because you took your glasses off yeah. before he's even sat up. Yeah. Um and it makes you more aware of your behavior, but also it makes you more aware of how boring we are. Because we don't have we don't have enough variation in our lives and enough patterns for a dog that's been bred to identify patterns, not to identify all of our patterns in our life within, you know, the first few months of living with us. Yeah. Um, and that's why when we're talking about these kind of neurodivergences they're like well they've been like that since you know the first couple of weeks they were home I'm like yeah because we're not interesting we're not yeah we're just you know we're, we're a nuclear family we're a small unit there's only so many behaviors we can display and they're bred to pick up on patterns of behaviors and anticipate them and react to them before they've become you know before we do it's it's, it's, like it's definitely doorbell. interesting the doorbell thing oh yeah so the doorbell goes so they know that there's somebody at the other side of the door so then they either get excited or they get you know nervous or whatever emotion that mm -hmm. particular dog is going to feel so if we taught them from the beginning that actually the doorbell meant as a cue go to your bed and yeah. stay there and then to allow somebody in but actually usually people only teach that after it's become a problem at the door um so we can use those patterns if we want to um to help even prevent that if that th sort of thing annoys us um I sort of want mine to alert me that people come to the house yeah. um but I will then you know say to my dogs thanks you can stand down now I've got this um you know yeah. and they don't just keep barking at my excitement for the yeah, next yeah. Time. um mine have have because sometimes things sound like the door and they're not um and my no when I exasperatedly go there's no one there they're like oh sorry false alarm all right I'll go back to bed um and I've had to be so careful not to be tempted to use that for when there's someone is there because then they'll not believe me anymore yes. um yeah. the I was I was going to think about something then and uh, for immediate there we go that's the ADHD thoughts yeah. that whiz in and whiz out um <laughs> that's really um that ties into the whole dopamine loop and rewards there, doesn't it? Because yeah. if you think of a clicker or a marker mm -hmm. word, if we click mm -hmm. our dog, that becomes, and they pair it with reward is coming, the secondary reinforcer, the clicker, becomes a little dopamine hit because they know that a reward is coming. So therefore, if we then click or mark our dog and don't reward, we lessen the value of the marker. So yeah. it's all on that reward loop. Um, so mm -hmm. don't lie to your dog, basically, isn't it? Don't lie to your dog, especially not a colleague. Oh, that's what I was going to say. So the other thing we have in my house of many dogs, um, which is linked to how you want a dog to be, is that um, the other thing that collies are bred for is to copy other dogs um, because it makes them way easier to train on a farm so most farmers that I know will see that their existing dog might be slowing down they'll bring a new pup in um, and mostly to make life easier for everyone 
that pup is trained by the existing dog. It copies. And you want a dog that will copy. And I have seen this in my house in terms of behaviours because um, my youngest dog, Elita, she's just absolutely lovely. Really nice dog, really clever. Um, and then I have Wallace, who was my last rehab dog, who can't be, he can't be rehomed. He can't, he's got too many, he's got too many risks. Um, so he has to stay with me. And behaviourally, he's, is quite unsound now if i was to be one of these people that was to say that a dog is autistic i could probably say that about wallace however if we go back to the icd descriptions one of the factors is that these things exist where there isn't any other explanation for it um so for example a neurological problem the thing about collies is that they are a neurological dog. We breed them for their brains. And when they are bred, there are traits that are considered. So when you when you're looking to when you're looking to breed a collie, you want to balance the traits of the bitch against the trace, the traits of the dog. So if a bitch has got a very strong eye, you don't want to put it to a dog with a very strong eye because what you end up with is what we call a sticky dog. So a dog with too much eye will see sheep and it'll immediately clap its belly down on the ground and all it wants to do is watch. And you're going to struggle to get that dog moving. Um, and you'll see this with dogs that, that chase cars. Not all of them want to follow the movement. Some of them clap down and just want to watch and then you can't get them to move and they'll just watch cars all day and not move so that's one of the things that you consider when breeding some people would consider temperament some people don't consider temperament at all because it doesn't apply to being on a farm doesn't matter if they bark at strangers doesn't matter if they're they're scared of strangers doesn't matter if they're scared of loud noises because they live on a farm they're not going to encounter these things these problems come when they're taken off of farm so you're breeding these dogs for all the things that you want but what you are intentionally doing is breeding in things that you have no idea exist because they've never presented in these two dogs that you want to put together now in the case of wallace um he's breeding the their farm their farm dogs they literally live in the middle of nowhere they're hill dogs so they gather large flocks of sheep um they don't do a lot with small numbers of sheep um and he was the most sensitive in the litter so when people came to pick their dogs he was the least outgoing he was the most naturally frightened basically no one wanted him and he was the last of the litter to go um and he was given to a farmer who lives um in the middle of nowhere somewhere called otterburn it's really cold in winter and he was a little puppy so they didn't want him to go there in the middle of winter because it's cold and he'd be living outside so that was kind that was nice and they asked me if i would take him for uh basic for his basic training until after winter and then he would go and do a sheepdog training wallace is the poster boy for using treats as reward um that dog just loves positive reinforcement he thinks that it's absolutely amazing that a world exists where he does the littlest of things that makes me happy and gets a piece of cheese for it and that's why it's called Wallace, because of Wallace and Gromit, who was originally called Hank. Um, so he came to me for his basic training. We did lead training. We did all of the things. Perfect for people. Very, very sensitive. Very sensitive. Um, you know, if I like to do things always positively, but I will change my tone of voice just to a little bit of a warning if they're, if they're going to do something that would harm them, um, you know, like run into a road or or, or think about, not doing as they're told say if I've told them to lie down because I've seen someone approaching and I want to recall them I'll say lie down in my normal happy voice and if he's not going to do it I'll just up the ante on that command lie down just lower my voice I'm not threatening them I'm just letting them know that there's a change in my intonation which they have to listen to and they do so <laughs> very sensitive dog that's all he needs in terms of a correction is a slight change in intonation 
So for my house, he went to um, a sheepdog trainer who is known for being harsh. He was there for three months and he failed as a sheepdog. I was told he was a danger to livestock and won't take a correction. And I, I think that this person's version of corrections was just out and out brutality. And unfortunately, Wallace was completely ruined. So actually, what we've got with Wallace is that he has been traumatised and that trauma... As we know, we know that, you know, I was I was in the military. My experience in the military is what made me decide to go into mental health. And all of that was because I learned about trauma and how it affects the brain. And this is what had happened to Wallace. I knew him as a puppy. He was perfect. Had him till six months old. So he's gone through all of that. Unfortunately, it did mean that he was most likely in a fear period when he went to a trainer. And this he wasn't my dog. Um but the trainer that he was sent to was brutal um, and Wallace could not handle that. And that changed his brain forever because of the fear um, and because of the trauma. So when we look at the ICD about autism and it says that it has to be in the absence of any other neurological reason or mental illness. Well, there isn't that with Wallace. There are other reasons why he behaves the way that he behaves. And that is because of his known history. But if you didn't know that, you would absolutely think that Wallace was autistic. His answer to anything that is even slightly worrying is to run in a circle and vocalise. So he goes round and round in a circle. In his head, what he's doing is he is taking control of a situation by running away. He's not running away. He's running in a circle, but he's tricking his body into thinking he's controlling it by running away. And this was the problem when he went to sheepdog training, when they said that he couldn't take a correction. When they corrected him, he'd bolt, he'd run away and he'd not come back for two days. So things frighten Wallace and he runs in a circle. And all the time he's running in a circle, he's vocalising. It's not barking. It's a it's a kind of repetitive, rhythmical whine. And he goes. <laughs> and it looks very. Autistic because it, it looks like vocal stimming. It's the repetitive movement. But that's not what it is. This is what happens when collies are broken. They use their decision-making to try and make their world better. And sometimes those ways of self-soothing, those ways of um, distracting themselves from the things that upset them in the world are repetitive. Yeah, They are neurological-looking um, but you, the, one of the things that I see quite often is that um, people make up histories for dogs. Yeah. They might rescue a dog. Um, they might get a dog from a farm and just presume that all farmers are awful, that these pups had a bad start in life. You know, loads of things. There's a lot, there's a lot of casting of aspersions that I see. Um, and I just think you've literally got no evidence to say that. Yeah. Um and I think as well, a really good thing that you've just mentioned about, you know, people get them from a farm and quite often you'll hear, oh, well, you know, they were just shot in a barn. But actually, when we look at where we take them into more urban environments, sometimes they really struggle with a visual overstimulation because they're bred to be sensitive to movement. Their eyes are formed that way um, to detect mm -hmm. much more movement than ours. Um, so the rods in their eyes are orientated differently to ours. So they can see movement at huge, huge distances. Then we bring mm. them into a busier environment with all these things moving around them. And then they maybe can't cope with that because they don't get yeah. downtime from all the movement. Whereas on a mm -hmm. farm, they'll be out working and then they might then be shut in a barn overnight but then they get learn that off switch and they don't have all the visual overstimulation. So I think this is something as well where they get misunderstood for um, yeah. people with ADHD. And sometimes. the benefits of that get misunderstood as well. Yeah. I mean, we as humans, one of the things that, that we sometimes do um, if we've got enough spare pennies is you can pay an absolute fortune to go and float in a sensory deprivation tank. And it's seen as therapeutic, as very good for the brain. You know, there's nothing in there but maybe a little bit of music for you to listen to and, and everything else. It's, you know, it's dark. It's, you know, sensory deprivation 
can be cruel or therapeutic. If if sensory deprivation is constant and sy systematic, if it is used as a tool of abuse, then it is a tool of abuse. But quite often it's not. And in rehabbing Collie, so I don't know if you might have seen them, but there's through there where all my plants are in the back there. That's that's my utility room. Um, and the utility room is the dog space. It's effectively a kennel. It stinks and there's vet bed everywhere. It's, it, it, it is the dog's space. So when I'm rehabbing collies, and like I say, Wallace was the last one, so I haven't done it for about four years, I think. So I take them from the farm, and usually they've been in a kennel. And that's their own space. They understand it is their space. They understand that when they're in there, it's the place to switch off. And this is why I have to have a space in my house for these dogs, because when I let them into the entire house, they don't know the difference between being having an entire house to dick about it, to, to mess about in, to having a garden to mess about in. They don't differentiate. All they know is that they've been let out. Now on a farm, I mean some some, you know, obviously some people take take their farm dogs for walks if, you know, if the mood takes them, but usually even if there's not work on, what you do is letting out. So they live in a kennel or they might live in the house in a in an area that's just for them. And then before work or whatever, you go through this process of letting out. They run about, they do what they want. They go, they go for a wee, they go for a poo, they go for a snuffle about. It's all under their own steam. And when I have them from farm into the house, Sometimes letting them into the rest of the house, you can see how overwhelming it is. They can't, they just can't be still because they've been let out. So what are we doing? So what's the plan? Um, and Flynn, I've had him for six, five or six years now. It's taken this long for him to know that there are other places where he can settle. He'll take some time. You let him into the living room and he's like, right, what are we doing? What are we doing? And he goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. What are we doing? Where we... He doesn't have any interesting toys. He doesn't, he likes food, but it's not, it's not high in his priority list. What he wants is physical, meaningful contact with me. So the only way that he settles in the house is if he's literally like in my face and then he might settle. And people would say that that is hyperactivity, especially because... When he's waiting for instruction, he moves. Yeah. So he literally goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, waiting to be told what to do. Um, and what I want him to do is chill. So I'll invite him onto the sofa or I'll ask him to go to, you know, go, you know, place, um, what do you call it? Like go on a go on a place. So go to bed, just rest. Yeah. 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 Work. yeah. So we do that. But it takes such a long time because his early conditioning was let out means work. Let out means we're doing something or playing with other dogs. So he came from literally the, the best setup for collies that you can have. She's a breeder and trainer called Michelle Anderson. She's so kind to her dogs. Um, and they live in kennels. And then across the road from their kennels, they have this whole field to themselves. It's a paddock. Um, and they go out there during the day and they're literally like free ranging collies. There's loads of them. It's, it's absolute heaven. But what it means is they've got really appropriate body language with each other. Um, he's a, a brilliant stooge dog because he can read what a dog is thinking and adjust his behavior to keep that situation friendly um, or to leave them alone if that's what they want. He's really good at reading other dogs. And the reason why he has that ability is because he's been let out from a small pup with 20 odd other dogs with such a vast amount of space that conflicts don't happen because if another dog says, if you come near me, I'm going to rip your face off. I want my own space. They can give space. Or if a dog's like, you're really frightening. I, I want my own space, then they can run away. They've got the space to do that. So what it creates is dogs with really, really nice behaviour in terms of their their social. And that's one of the things with the, the, the autism thing and the ASD thing is that, you know, communicating with other people can be really difficult and you can mess it up over and over again. Well, maybe not mess it up because you can't help it, but that's one of the bits that's difficult. And I think that's one of the other things that people put on dogs is 
well, they can't communicate very well with other dogs. But that's because we don't set them up in natural environments that facilitate good communication. We have them on leads. We're controlling their movement when we want them to interact with, with other dogs. So they can't do that properly. And it becomes overwhelming. So they go, do you know what? Just leave me alone. I can't communicate properly because I'm on a lead behind a fence, in a car, in a house, in a calf, in a pub, whatever it may be. You're not providing the environment for good social interactions. Yeah. And, and that's where these labels come in again. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just sounds like heaven, that environment for the... Um, <laughs> really you know. nice. But how many people actually <laughs> raise them like that? So if we think of just um, most Border Collies aren't actually raised in that scenario. So then they go to their home which is more of a pet home. So there may be one other dog, but there may not be. Um, then they go to puppy class. And quite often by then, they're getting overwhelmed by a busy puppy class environment. Quite often collies are actually labeled as, um, you know, a bit disruptive, shall we just call yeah. it that, before being, yeah, kicked that. Of, yeah. before being kicked out of puppy class. Um, so I think that, you know, it needs to be done appropriately, doesn't it? It's like border collies in daycare can become a real nuisance because they're not used to being with lots of other dogs if they're not raised that way in the first place. Um, and so then it can be overstimulating. And so it's really difficult to get that balance if you're not recognizing your own border collies body language in those situations yeah. and the appropriate dogs actually put them with yeah and the and other people not recognizing what what normal border collie dog dog interactions look like so uh certainly for my dogs and, and all of them the the way that they play would probably be a little bit terrifying to a dog that didn't understand it because firstly they start off by staring which is quite intimidating for a non-collie dog a yeah. stare is is a precursor to aggression but for collies it's like right I'm staring yeah stare back at me this is what we're doing now we're staring and then we stalk and then right at the last minute I'm going to run as fast as I can at your face and I'm going to go and bite your face and then I'm going to run away and you have to chase me and the other dog's like oh I don't want you to bite my face I don't want to play this game it sounds awful and they're like no this is what we do stary stary bitey facey chasey chasey and then that's how it goes um and and that's what they want to do and other dogs are literally like this is terrifying I hate collies and I hear this a lot when um it's always my dog was attacked by a collie on the beach so my dog doesn't like collies I'm like was your dog attacked or did the collie stalk it run at it bite its face and then run away and she's like well that's that's what being attacked is I'm like it's not it's just collies playing and the other thing is is collies like to judge a reaction by biting as well it's a really good way of um, it's, it's awful isn't it but it's a really good way for them to figure out how people are going to react um like they want to know what happens if they bite you or if they bite a dog like what happens when I do this yeah and they'll do a nip and yeah. if it creates a drama they're like huh created a drama and that's the manipulation thing that's come back again because when they're young they haven't learned that decision making what they do learn is that biting creates an enormous reaction and for them it can be quite fun and that's where you get these collies that just are quite bitey there's no malice in it it's just something that they've that they've learned creates a huge reaction and it's cause and effect. Collies love effects. They love having an effect. That's what makes them manipulative. It doesn't mean that we think that they're mean or that they're awful. It's just the way that they are. They like eliciting behaviours in other animals and it doesn't have to just be sheep. Um, quite a lot of my dogs value being able to herd other dogs above being able to herd sheep just because it's more of a challenge so they get more of that dopamine yeah. no it's it's uh it, ding is my um dog that has the best dog body language so he could be used as a stooge dog because he's great like that um if friends have got puppies and they want them to meet a really appropriate dog then his he's fantastic with puppies as well um but he does exactly that with the play and he runs at, straight at, and then does what I call a little flyby. So he might even jump over them um, and yeah. air snaps as he goes. Um, mm -hmm. 
And it, to be, I'll be totally honest, and I say this about Bo, my youngster, he's the harder eye clapper. So he goes to the ground yeah. if he sees Ding coming. Yeah. Like that. Goes like that. Ding then jumps over the top of him doing an air snap. But it's actually, it's frightened Bo a little bit. So Bo's now a little yeah. bit, oh. A bit cringy, yeah. Yeah. But they'll still play those chase games in the field and Bo will instigate that in exactly that way. He'll go up to him, he'll look at him and stalk him and then he'll go, come on, let's run. And yeah. then they do those lovely running and chasing. So, Huge collie loops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Collies love a circle. Yeah. <laughs> they love circles. Yeah. And if you look at other breeds like German Shepherds, they play in a very different way, don't they? They're very sort of um, very physical. Um, Wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And other dogs don't like that um my mini american yeah. shepherd stands up on her back legs and boxes um yeah. and you know whereas you don't see that as much with the collies it's more so they're very um their play styles are very different um yeah yeah but you and know it's kind of seen as aggression when quite often it's not that the driver for the behavior isn't aggression it's just instinct yeah they're so misunderstood by so many people aren't they yeah yeah unfortunately no. Um, but yeah, the, the, my my youngest, Alita, she was the first one I ever took to puppy classes because I just thought it was the right thing to do. Awful for her because it was in like a like a, a community hall. So it had a wooden floor, high vaulted ceilings, um, and the other dogs had jangly equipment on. And one of them had a squeaky toy and she walked in there and the sounds, all of the sounds and all of the other dogs and all of the movement just blew her tiny mind. It was just awful for her. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about, oh, you know, this dog was shut in a barn. I mean, Lita wasn't shut in a barn. She was actually, she was raised, um, she was sort of kennel through the day while um while farming was going on and then they were in the house when someone was in the house so she had a really nice upbringing her breeder is just he's really good you know he's he's read books on behavior he wants his dogs to be nice and um, but i chose her because i knew that she was going to be a problem for want of a better word when i saw them as puppies she was always separating herself from the rest of, from the rest of the pile um you know the other four would sleep in a big puppy pile and she'd take herself off and sleep by herself when they were all playing together she'd get a toy and go play with it by herself you know she was these are indicators to me that she was probably going to require a little bit more attention a little bit more handling um and that because of that she might be the most likely to fail um and so with that in mind I took her to the puppy classes and it just it was just so much for her and actually what I did was I just we just and I'm not saying other people should do this it was just appropriate for her what we did was just avoided everything that was too much for her because she wasn't her brain wasn't developed enough to cope with it and yeah. because she couldn't cope with it the only thing she could do was develop ineffective coping strategies. Yeah. She needed to mature. She needed time to develop. Um, and she needed to learn some behaviours of dogs that that knew the ropes. Um, and she, the very first time she ever saw a car, she went into stance and she was like, that means staring at it. I'm going to yeah. stare at it, stare at it, stare at it. And then as soon as it's gone past her, she's pulling to to go and stare at the back of it very interesting cars from day dot the first time she ever saw one and we live on a roman road so a dead straight road that you can see you know the end of it disappears over a hill you can see for miles down this really straight road which meant that she could fixate on a car three miles in the distance if not further the whole time it made walking really difficult so i just never walked her on that road because it's going to teach her behaviors that are ineffective um, and it's going to allow her the opportunity to develop those behaviors and then you end up with them stacking don't you yeah so we just didn't do that when she wanted to go for walks she'd go from the house into the car and go and walk in places where there weren't cars there weren't until she was mature enough until she'd gone you know had a first season settled her hormones all of that and then once all that had happened and this is you know she's two at this point um then I would start walking her with a dog that 
doesn't do that at all. And that is quite hot on rules. That's the other thing with the, the comparing the autism thing um, is that it mentioned in the ICD about strict adherence to rules. Another thing that you might accidentally breed into a dog because you want it to be obedient. And with obedience comes a conformance to a set of rules that, you know, the person that's handling them has like, you know, we don't bite people. We don't do this. We don't whatever it may be. There are a set of rules. And if you put two dogs together because you like how obedient they are, sometimes what you end up with is a dog that really likes rules and following rules because it keeps them comfortable. And um, they like the boundaries. They like to know um, that there's a. Uh, a set expectation to conform to that keeps them safe um, and that pleases you because they want to please us. So Ren is my dog that does that. Um, she is a little bit bitey. She's quite nippy with the other dogs in terms of um, keeping to the rules. If they aren't keeping to the rules, she will nip, she'll glare at them. And if they're still breaking rules, she will nip them. Um, and that's just the way that she is. Obviously, I don't let her do that, but some, she's sneaky. So. I walked Alita with Ren um, and Alita went, oh, there's a car. And Ren went, we don't do that. Yeah. She just she glared at her with a, li with a little slight lip raise as a warning, like, and if you keep doing that, I will nip you. And, and Alita was like, well, I'll just not look at the car then. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's where you get that learning from one to the other. And um, that worked really well. So stooge dogs in, in training collies are you know, it's it's a really good idea. It's so nice that you use Ding for that because a lot of trainers, obviously, you know, you can't always have a dog that you can use as a stooge. But if you do, particularly in training collies, um, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. And also it goes the other way. So um, I see a lot of uh, people thinking, oh, they're young, they're active, they'd like a friend. But then they haven't actually trained that one to the level that they want them to be. And then they get a puppy and then the puppy learns all of the unwanted behaviors from the mm -hmm. adolescent that is going through that tricky adolescent um, time where he's finding his own feet and, you know, pushing boundaries and uh, lacking a bit more of the impulse control. Um, and then the puppy learns that too. And then all of a sudden you've got to walk two that are kicking off and doing all these unwanted things. So yeah, be careful what they are exposed to. <laughs> Um, that happened yeah. with that happened with Ren. I thought, uh, sorry, Alita. I thought she'd be quite a nice balance with Wallace, with all of his um, sort of neuroticism and and, and trauma related behaviours, and Alita being quite chill. I was like, she'll be fine. They'll they'll pair up quite nicely together. Um, and now Alita's doing circles too. Yeah, because she thinks she just saw him doing it, and she's like, "Oh, I don't accept." The difference with her is when she's so usually it's a trigger, a knock on the door, or something like that. And Wallace is round and round in circles as as fast as he can, like something's worrying. Um, so when Alita does it, she just does one as fast as she can. She's like, "I'm going to do that." Whoosh around the living room, and then stop. Um, it's as it's it's really easy for these things to happen, and then you think, "Oh, what have I done?" Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I can't undo that now either. It's totally ingrained. And that's, that's the thing, isn't it? The one off. Yeah, but nothing, nothing gives her that rush like that. That one circle as fast as she can. You know, she's not interested. If I chuck some, if I chuck some cheese on the floor, she will. She'll stop doing it. And she'll eat the cheese. But then once the cheese is gone, she'll just do it anyway. I can only delay it. I haven't. I haven't been able to break that behaviour because it just. This is the other thing with collies is those. And again, why people think that it might be a neurodivergence is because once they've found a behavior that gives them the dopamine, you're going to have to present something so high value to give the same dopamine response in order to stop them from doing that. And it's really difficult because food isn't going to do it. Puggies aren't going to do it. A ball might, but then you're just feeding into a ball obsession. And that's why their repetitive behaviours are so hard to break. And that's why people think that it's a neurodivergence, because it's a case of nothing that I do changes the behaviour. Um, and so that's why people think that it's it's a medical problem, not a training issue, not just the way that the dog's been bred. 
it's because of how their brains are, are wired yep. in terms of working. You want them to keep repeating the behaviors that give them the dopamine because that usually means that they're doing a good job. But in the absence of a job, in the absence of fulfillment, they'll just develop these things. Yeah, definitely. And this is, again, goes back to that. We need to develop our reward structure before we actually put it into the training because otherwise the training won't work regardless. So, yeah, yeah. No, it's fantastic. So just a couple of other things that I've jotted yes. down to talk about on this subject. Um, so obviously some people receive medication um, yes. and then some people who think that their dog has then got ADHD feels that they should have medication. But um, you obviously will know a lot more and understand a lot more about the drugs involved in these things because yeah. am I right in saying that people with ADHD are given more of a stimulant type of medication to help um, yeah. them to increase the dopamine levels? Yeah. Can you imagine putting a border collie on a stimulant? Yeah. Rather so than- there are... There are stimulants that, that also have um, a kind of, um, uh, so some of the drugs that are used um, will work to increase um, calm, focus and attention, even though they're a stimulant. Yeah. Um, Adderall is a, a good example of that, which we don't really use in the UK because it's such a drug of abuse. Um, Ritalin is a drug of abuse as well. So what these are is they're they're kind of an amphetamine based drug. Um, there's a bit of a misconception that based on drugs alone, you can give a diagnosis so that uh, if someone's hyperactive and you give them a drug for ADHD um, and that that improves them, then that means that they've got ADHD. And that's a, a an outdated way of thinking. There was one um, veterinarian who suggested that an old English sheepdog had ADHD and they prescribed I don't know how they managed to do this but they did prescribe this dog um I think it was either Ritalin or or, or Adderall and the dog improved and they based that as a reason for saying that this dog had ADHD it doesn't work like that if you give a dog a medication to increase attention it's quite likely it will increase tension, but you can't base a diagnosis on that because the 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 way the pharmaceuticals work will elicit that in someone that doesn't have ADHD. So there's a bit of a, a myth there, but even with people who do have ADHD, sometimes the drugs don't always fit. Um, sometimes you you give the stimulants in order to increase the dopamine Um, And it might do, but sometimes the stimulant effects just don't sit well. Sometimes they make you feel really unwell, um, jittery, uh, worse in terms of attention. Um, It's a really difficult thing to find the right fit. Uh, You know, some of us do quite well just being addicted to caffeine because caffeine will will keep the dopamine going. Um, so the the pharmaceutical side of things, it's a real um, battle to find what medication suits you um, and suits your uh, neurochemicals as well. And it that that one study about the old English sheepdog that was given the the Ritalin or, or whatever it was, it's one dog that was given one drug that is known to pretty much across the board improve attention um it's the one that previously certainly when i was working in in children's mental health that's the one that we'd start children on um because it was the most likely to work and this was when you know we weren't too sure if uh if the child did have adhd or if perhaps um it was more of a a, an environmental response to things that were going on in their life so yeah, I I would I would strongly um be cautious of anyone, whether it's a vet or a trainer or anyone, who says that they think that your dog has ADHD and that to 
ask your vet for medication for that because even in humans it's so hard to diagnose and as we've just spoken about so much of it is a breed trait and if you get that medica if it's if that medication is wrong for that dog getting off it is really difficult and it can permanently change the brain chemistry you can have adverse reactions to these drugs that are really quite serious and long lasting um certainly with the ADHD medications. Um, there are other medications that uh, a lot of kind of hyperactive or hyperfearful um, dogs can be given that aren't ADHD medications, um, but they aren't going to affect dopamine. They're, they're most likely to affect sertraline or monamine oxidase. And even in that, if it doesn't work well, um, coming off of them causes problems in itself. So. Mental health medication, it's a it's a huge subject. It's one that I um I kind of have a special interest in anyway. And the way that the the medical profession is going in terms of mental health medications, um, a lot of the time is that actually they're they're becoming less uh less valuable. For certain people, obviously they're life saving. Um, but for certain things, what we're finding is that the medication route is far less effective than um, looking at uh, interventions that support and facilitate um, better behaviour. So in terms of humans, we, we would do CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy, um, dialectical behavioural therapy, all different types of talking therapy, which obviously is really hard to apply to a dog. So actually CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, there's there is scope for doing that with dogs. Um, what I do with people, if we're trying to change behavior, um, I think there's a, there's a belief that CBT, what it does is it tries to teach you to ignore the behavior and that's not what it is. It puts in place things that you can do to improve your brain chemistry before engaging in the behavior that might tick that box, but that isn't healthy. So for me, with Wallace, he's the best example because he's probably the one of my dogs that kind of fits um, the category of there's probably something wrong and I think it might be a neurodivergence. It's not that, but it could look like that. So with him, if he's engaging in a behaviour that is unhealthy, repetitive, so he's circling and vocalising, that's the main thing, um, that's usually in response to being frightened, there's steps that we can take to distract him from that behavior and to do something that's going to um, elicit a, a neurochemical response to calm him. So for Wallace, it's dead easy. He is of the opinion that nothing bad ever happens when he's got his lead on because nothing ever has. You get Wallace's lead out and he's like, oh, brilliant amazing nothing ever bad happens when I've got the lead on when I've got the lead on we go for walks I get treats um I meet nice people yeah. it's an absolute safe space for him so the first thing we'll do if Wallace is engaging in a behavior um like that is we'll put his lead on and instantly he feels safe yeah now for someone else's dog that could be it could be going for a walk. It could be having a sit in the car. It could be getting the favourite toy out. The, the thing about these kind of behavioural interventions is that if you've got a very fearful dog or a dog that is engaging in, in unwanted behaviours or behaviours that challenge um, multiple times a day, is it can feel like a full-time job. Um, and especially if you've got a dog that doesn't have... Uh, a good uh, library of things that they can engage in that make them feel better. It can feel quite hopeless. Yeah. Um, and when people come to me for CBT, they feel the same. It might be that they've got PTSD, depression. It might be that they're someone that hasn't been able to leave the house or get out of bed or get dressed or wash themselves or have a shower or anything for weeks and weeks and weeks and it doesn't matter what tiny thing I suggest it feels overwhelming and it can feel like that with training your dog so all you have to do is find something small um, and you only have to engage in it for a second and then you can build on that 
And I've had that with the dogs um, that I've rehabbed. Flynn, when he came to me, um, he only ever he only ever came out of the crate when my back was turned. And as soon as I turn round, quick as a shot, he'd fly back into his crate so hard it would bounce off the wall. And he hadn't been abused. He was just extremely sensitive. And he'd come from that beautiful environment. And he, when I'm talking about the dogs that are bred to be amazing companions, he felt that so hard. He loved that woman. He loved his owner. He wasn't to know that, you know, he he didn't meet the criteria that she had in mind for a really good sheepdog and therefore was sold. Every person he was sold to, he tried to get away from and run home because he was so loyal to her. Yeah. Um, it took a long time for him to realise that he could have that loyalty with me. And now he's like a boil on my bum. Oh, he's physically attached to me at every given opportunity. Um, but for him, it was it was almost impossible to to get him to engage with me because he didn't want to engage with me. He wanted to be with his person. Um there was no way of, of getting him to understand that other than time. And this is one of the other things that is, is you need to give yourself time. People see these things, especially with awful people that are using um, aversives. The thing about aversives, especially with collies, is, yeah, they work really quickly. But the fallout that comes from them, that comes in time. Yeah, And this is what, you know, I see all the time is, yeah, that dog's really, really obedient. But at what cost? Yeah. You don't see the cost immediately. It comes in um, down the line. So taking the time to find these little things that that you can practice yeah. over time becomes a bigger improvement. I love this it. is one of the things. Yeah. I love that you said about um Wallace's the lead is his safety. Because um yeah. So what we try and do with the mat work is not just teach our dog to go to a point and lie down um, because that's just making them stay somewhere. We want to actually condition that mat or that bed or whatever so that it has a change in the emotional response so that when the dog actually sees the bed, lies on it, they know that they're safe. So we protect that. We wouldn't take them into a difficult environment and ask them to lie on their mat and then let an aggressive dog run up to them or a person that they were scared of. If something like that was going to happen, we'd get them up off of the mat so that we protected that and kept the emotional mm -hmm. response to the mat. So um, mm -hmm. condition safety cues and all things like that can be really helpful. And as you say, it might feel like you're not actually doing anything when you start to pair these things, but actually it takes time to change a dog or a person's emotions. But then once mm -hmm. you've got that safety cue there, it can be really, really powerful in starting to change yeah. um, what we've actually got. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be the same as someone else. You can really think outside of the box. The you know these these dogs are, are bred for their unique abilities, and sometimes what comes out is a very unique dog with some very unique needs. Um, for who's who's my weirdest one? Lita. Her so one of the things is um about meeting needs and if a dog can rely on you to meet their needs that's a cornerstone of their foundations and the thing is is that sometimes collies have weird needs um and you have to be a bit of a detective to find out what that is so you might end up when we were talking about cbt and things like that um changing behaviors in order to build a therapeutic relationship and this is what happens with me and my human patients when they first come to me we don't have a therapeutic relationship they don't know me i don't know them i don't know what works for them and, and it takes time but once we've discovered the things that work our relationship builds too um and again, Wallace is a really good example. Yes, we we figured out that we can create a safe space just by putting a lead on him. But also, because we've created um, a therapeutic relationship, he knows he can rely on me to keep him safe. Um, and this was evidenced really well recently. We were on a walk and a dog escaped from its garden and I was walking Wallace and Wren. Um, and it charged at us extremely aggressively. Um, and it targeted Ren and I picked Ren up and kind of chucked her over my shoulder and kept this dog at bay with my foot, just kind of waving my leg about, keeping it about. And in all of this commotion, I dropped Wallace's lead because Ren was the one that was being targeted. 
Um, and by the time I'd seen this dog off and it had gone back into his garden, I just thought, oh my goodness, where's Wallace? And he'd literally the whole time just stayed behind me because he could rely on me. He could see what was happening. And he was like, she's, she's got this under control. Yeah. 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 You've got to be that for your collie dog mind, because if they think this is the other thing about them being so clever and spotting patterns and all the rest of it. If you don't show them that you can, be reliable to keep them safe they're going to develop behaviors to keep themselves safe whether they work or not that's not the point but they've got no choice but to take things into their own hands Um, and I see this quite a lot I mean it's no one's fault that you might have a collie but that you're also a very mild character and that you avoid confrontation um, and that you might find the world scary too there's nothing wrong with pretending and this is also something that we use in um, in psychology is that sometimes if you pretend long enough, eventually that's what comes to be. Um, there's a really good psychological study with that about um, training people who used to be in love and had fallen out of love with each other and wanted a divorce in terms of couples therapy with just kind of teaching them. If you do things that people in love do, eventually you will be in love again. Um, And I thought that was a really nice concept in terms of a healthy relationship with your colleague, because love comes with trust. If you behave like a trustworthy person, even though you might not feel it at the time, with practice, it comes to be and your colleague will see that. And they might just calm down a little bit. They might not feel like they need to be controlling everything all of the time, because in their eyes, you can't. Sometimes yeah. that's something that needs addressing as well. Is your your human to dog relationship? Definitely. You know, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. I know that we could talk about our colleagues. Hopefully, day. We'll, <laughs> we'll help people just think a little bit more strongly about labeling their border collies, um, and mm. also that it doesn't mean that they've got a bad dog they can still learn to work with them if they understand the breed and understand their individual dog within that breed as to why they're doing those behaviors because quite often it's because that's what they've actually been bred to do in the first place they they haven't got a wrong one they haven't got a bad dog they've just got a border collie yeah oh i'm glad i have though (laughs) (laughs) all of them the challenges they present (laughs) right it's it makes it interesting doesn't it great well, thank you so much holly for joining me for this chat today thank um, you. I hope that people have listened and enjoyed it um and maybe taken something positive away from it as well hope so thank you very much